Hi, I'm Sarah Glassberg. I'm Brad Pilcher. And this is AJFF In Conversation, the Jewish film podcast. I am incredibly excited to talk about a singular filmmaker today who is, in my opinion, one of the quintessential Jewish voices in cinematic history. And she is not talked about enough in that conversation. Amidst the Steven Spielbergs, the Mel Brooks, and the Woody Allens, there is Nora Ephron. Yes, back when romantic comedies ruled the theaters, she was synonymous with the best of them. When Harry Met Sally, Sleepless in Seattle, and You've Got Mail, all of which she wrote, the latter two of which she directed. She directed eight films. She produced 10 films, but she wrote 14, along with three plays and a slew of essays and the novel Heartburn, which she later adapted for the screen. It was as a writer that she was at her best, and a writer, it was what she started out as. And until her passing in 2012, an active writer was what she remained. In fact, her last play, Lucky Guy, which was also Tom Hanks's Broadway debut, premiered the year after Nora Ephron's death, and it earned her a posthumous Tony nomination. While she was most well-known for those famous rom-coms, her life and career showed incredible range. She broke into journalism back when Newsweek refused to hire women writers, and she ended up blazing a trail, much of it in the pages of Esquire. When she died decades later, she was described as the enfant terrible of the new journalism era. It was her second marriage to journalist Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame that led her to rewrite an early unused script for All the President's Men. Her work led to an offer for a TV screenwriting gig. The first film of hers to make it to the screen was 1983's Silkwood, but she adapted her own novel Heartburn in 1986, all before making her career with 1989's When Harry Met Sally. She also wrote vociferously about food. She lived life to the absolute fullest. And I want to take a brief moment to just list some of the attendees at her funeral, just to give you a sense of who she befriended over her 71 years. The guest list included Meryl Streep, Tom Hanks, Billy Crystal, Meg Ryan, Rob Reiner, Barbara Walters, Diane Sawyer, Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, Alan Alda, Steve Martin, Martin Short, Lorne Michaels, Larry David, Annette Benning, Matthew Broderick, Nicole Kidman, Michael Bloomberg, Ron Howard, Gail King. I could keep going. I won't. I know. It sounds like you have to catch your breath there, Brad. But um, in other words, yeah, Nora Ephron was clearly amazing. And it's high time we talked about what made her amazing. And to help us do just that, we are very happy to welcome Eleanor Ringel Cater, who served as the film critic of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for almost 30 years. Oh, and was also nominated for mul- mul- uh, multiple times for the Pulitzer Prize. Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. And also, I'm so pleased that y'all are excited and sort of on Nora Ephron's side. I wasn't sure when I said, yeah, I'll do this because, you know, sometimes it's not cool to be on Nora Ephron's side. Why is that, do you think? Because I, I mean, first of all, I grew up watching those films um, and, and just was completely transfixed by her particular voice as a screenwriter. I didn't even realize she was directing these films at the time. I wasn't paying attention. I was just, you know, a, a young guy. But I'm always surprised by people who don't love Nora Ephron. Why do you think that's the case? Well, the easy answer is because she's a girl. Um, I'm not sure if that explains everything. And I was actually surprised that um, two of her biggest fans are Stephen Colbert and Quentin Tarantino. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Which I, I and I'm, I'm with them. I'm a hundred percent in their camp. But it makes perfect sense to me uh, that they, they would be because those are two people who just have an enormous appreciation for good writing, which is what she was. I mean, first and foremost, she was a good writer. Exactly. I, I think there, uh, there's a kind of parallel, especially with the early, earlier, funnier Woody Allen, in that she's not necessarily filmic. I mean, it, it's not so much like you go wow, look at the way that thing was shot. Look at how she framed that. Look at the editing of that. Look at this or that, which is a lot of what people said about Woody Allen. In many ways, the strength, as you guys already said, is in the words and in the characters. Yeah, I mean, she 
is somebody who kind of accidentally got into screenwriting. She was she was a she was a journalist. I mean, she was part of that new journalism era, the the era that that gave us Norman Mailer and gave us you know all of that fantastic magazine writing that came out in the late sixties. And she just happened to be married to Carl Bernstein and happened to help him on the script for uh, All the President's Men. And and from there, you know, she went on to to make these really classic films. I I do wonder, when I look back at her career now, having sort of read a lot of her essays, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I love her as a screenwriter as much as I love her as an essayist, as a journalist. I mean, I love everything that she did, but... I, Having found her through the movies, I wonder um, what it must have been like for people in the 60s and 70s who kind of came to Nora Ephron first as a journalist, because she was, um, I mean, people look back on at her work and they think of these very charming romantic comedies, but she was not a sweet, <laughs> wilting flower as a writer, as a, as a woman per, in that era, sort of breaking into journalism. How do you remember? I mean, how did you discover her first? What what was your history with her? It was it was first through um, reading her, um, and I didn't even know so much that that's somebody to seek out. Um, it wasn't like I was looking for Owen's voice or anything like that. It was just um, sort of stumble across her, and the voice is so distinctive. It's so enjoyable. She's just funny and tart. And you're, um, I actually have a friend that met her once and I said, Oh, oh, it's so cool. What's she like? What's she like? And, and my friend goes, Well, I was a little, a little scared of her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You read her, didn't you? Before you got the, the sweeter uh, romantic comedies, you were reading the thing about, you know, my breasts or the thing she did about the publisher of the New York, was it the New York post or the daily news? It, it was the post. Yeah. She, uh, she was not, she was not all too kind to, uh, to Dorothy Schiff. Uh, and, and, and she also pissed off Betty for Dan. I mean, she, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing people I think forget people who only know her from the movies really probably do think of her as this very sweet, charming filmmaker. And she is a very sweet, charming in a way. She is very sweet and charming filmmaker. But this is a woman who she was part of a class action lawsuit against Newsweek, um, right. which was uh, for those who um, who saw a few years ago, Amazon did a whole series called Good Girls Revolt, which is based on a book called The Good Girls Revolt, where she was which which she was part of because she participated in the class action lawsuit because they wouldn't let women write. They only hired male writers. Um, yeah, and be in the uh, what was it? The mail room is where you could be as as a woman, and that was. It kind of reminds me. Remember the documentary they did on Ruth Bader Ginsburg a couple of years ago? Yeah, and she's at the top of her class in Harvard, and she's top of the class in Columbia. And one of her colleagues, a male colleague, goes to you know talk her up to some white shoe law firm, and he talks her up and talks her up, and then he uses the pronoun she. And the guys go, and this is in 1962. The guys go, oh, well, we don't hire women. Like, Whoa, 1962. It was not that long ago. And, and you know, and she was always funny. I mean, she was, I think her actual, she came of, she came to fame initially as a, almost like a satirist. Her essays were kind of funny. You talked about a few words about breasts, which is what, it, which is one of her most famous essays. But, you know, she wrote uh, a satire of many, many things. She, she wrote about her former boss, Dorothy Schiff at the Post. She satirized um, Women's Wear Daily, I think, in the late six, which was, you know, I think she got threatened with lawsuits. I mean, Betty, it's just, she was funny, but she was, but she was not sweet. She was very cutting. She was formidable. She was funny, but she was formidable. You didn't necessarily mess with her, you know, or you did so at your own peril. Yeah. And I think that was always true. I think probably Rob Reiner would have said that, 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 that none of that had gone away by the eighties when she was working on when Harry met Sally with, with him. But that to me is the first part of the, the sort of um, special, recipe that was her. It was that sort of cutting observational style. Because when I look at her films, and I look at her screenwriting, as well as her essay work, it wasn't just that she was good with a turn of phrase. She was. It was that she was incredibly uh, insightful. She was always paying attention. And she converted what she was seeing into her writing, almost in real time. 
Yeah. And I think that that's one of the hardest things to do. I mean, just to go sort of straight through to have that that voice that immediately comes from her her head onto the page. Yeah, I'm going to put Sarah, I want to put you on the spot and I apologize, but I think you were I think you were born after she really became the Nora Ephron of the 80s. Um so I mean I'm curious what you think because you missed all of this. Like you by the time you were born, she had already made when when uh, when, uh, when Harry met Sally, I think. She'd already made a bunch of this stuff. So I mean, how did you I'm curious, deeply curious how you came to Nora Ephron, what your sort of initial thoughts on when you first started encountering her work. Yeah, um, not putting me on the spot at all. And you are correct that I um, I was born, let's see, Sleepless in Seattle was 1993, correct? Is that the right release year? Okay, so I, I don't mind just sharing. Yes, I was born the year before that. So I was a little even too young to have seen that. Um, at the time, um, or even, you know, as a kid, I think the, my first introduction to Nora Ephron, which I'm actually glad that you asked this question, Brad, because it, it actually speaks to something that I've been very interested in hearing both your opinions on, um, as longer time fans of Nora Ephron and thinking about kind of just thinking about the impact she left on a lot of different things. Um, you know, since her passing, because my first introduction to her was actually Julie and Julia, I think. Um, I was probably like in high school at that time. And, you know, big, I used to do theater, big fan of Meryl Streep. uh, But I didn't have all that context of like how many times she had worked with Meryl Streep and that she loved food and that she had this sort of, um, I don't know, iconography around her, um, this sort of reputation, if you will. So I actually sort of have been catching up in preparation for this episode on all of these incredible things that she was also known for. I mean, there's this documentary on HBO Max that her son did a a few years back, and it just, it was dizzying, just all the different things that, um, that she accomplished and how many lives that she touched, uh, you know, in, in the film world and yeah. So, so my question in answering that question from Brad would be now that we are sort of in a different era when it comes to romantic comedies in particular, and I should mention that romantic comedies are not my favorite genre, um, but I find hers to be, as you said, so sort of nimble and realistic and they're not over the top. They're not um, kind of saccharine in, in the ways that I have come to no romantic comedies. So I'd love to hear both your thoughts on the the idea that she was this fierce, formidable, um, you know, female voice who satirized so much and broke into male dominated industries. But then she kind of went into this more women dominated genre in a way. So what are your thoughts on that? And like, how, how do those two things fit together? Brad, you go first. <laughs> I will answer it by saying that the, the the biggest question on my mind going into this episode, um, and one of the reasons why I asked you what I asked you, Sarah, was that I've, I've I'm worried not worried, but I, I I'm curious about what her legacy will be because she she came of age in a time where she had to be fierce and formidable um, to succeed, and, and she did it beyond, I think, anyone's wildest imagination of what was possible, um, both in the field of journalism, but also in screenwriting and playwriting. Um, And Brad, I don't mean to interrupt, but one thing that I just thought of, and I don't want to lose the thought later, is that um, I feel like as a filmmaker, too, then she sort of was, she sort of had to be in that genre, I think. I mean, I think we're only just now seeing female filmmakers emerge in other kinds of filmmaking beyond films for women about women. I mean, Catherine yes. Bigelow and um, some others I could probably name if I thought about it, but I think, I think that's, what's interesting to me. And I'll, I want to hear more about what you think because she, she was just such a unique female voice that had all of that strength and all of that. Um, she was just so dynamic and magnetic, but, but she, funneled that into a genre that we 
that didn't necessarily have the the best kind of place in pop culture, I would say. And, and yeah, so I'll let you finish, yeah. but, um, no, but, it's a, it's a phenomenal point. Yeah. And that, that really speaks to why I'm curious because we don't live in that era anymore. I mean, certainly sexism has not gone away. Um, oh, you don't, you think it's still with us? Gee, <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> but we do live in this time where someone like her is not abnormal. Um, and there are people who have clearly been influenced by her, who were friends of hers. Who, you know, Lena Dunham's memoir is dedicated to her. Um, she was, after she died, um, I think Helen Mirren and Susan Sarandon were at Carlo Vivari and they talked about her. I, I just, there's tons of, of incredible women who are working today, young women even, who have been clearly influenced by her. But for people who did not come of age when she was producing um, those films, when she was, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, when she was kind of at the peak of her career, do they remember her? Do they, you know, do they look back at those? You talk about romantic comedies being a genre that um, she might have been pigeonholed into a little bit, and I think that's true. I also think it's also fair to say that that was a much more that was a much more prestigious genre. It was a much more financially successful genre. Certainly, culturally, the cachet of that genre was higher at that time. So it wasn't quite pigeonholing. It was a little pigeonholing. But also, it's a genre that has declined. You don't see that kind of film, you know, on the big screen a lot anymore. So even people who love romantic comedies may not have as much opportunity to revisit her work if, if they don't already know about it. So I'm always deeply curious about you know, what her legacy will be as we move into an era that I'm sure she would have been delighted that we were moving into, um, where, you know, that kind of strong woman, sort of fierce and cutting and clever, all of the things that she was, is is more common, or at least is perceived as more common. I think there was always, it was always there, but it wasn't always rewarded um, in the way that she was able to find success. So for me, you know, I look back at her work so fondly, and I look back at her fondly because I think she as a person was so thoughtful. But I, but I, you know, and I'm, you know, I have a son, he's two. I, I wonder when he's old enough, I'll certainly be introducing him to her work. But I just wonder what her legacy will be in 10 or 15 years um, with the next generation, with your generation. Um, that's what I'm so deeply curious about because, and it's a good thing on, on, on some level. But it's sad because she was just so good at it. She was such a good writer, such an insightful observationalist. I don't know. What do you think, Eleanor? Well, <clears throat> trying to come up with a romantic comedy became so much harder as women became more equal. Mm -hmm. there were, <laughs> when I was in college, I took some French literature course, and I'm going to really slaughter the name of this book, but... It, the Princesse du Clive, something like that, written by some guy in the 17th or 18th century about the royal court. And um, the main character is married, but starts to have an affair with somebody at court. And while it's still secret, it's great because there's obstacles, you know, you got to kind of sneak around and stuff like that. And But once it comes out in the open, it's like, not as sexy, not as, you know, it, it just doesn't have its sort of tinge. And we have to remember, you know, not so long ago, the idea of having sex before marriage or just ideas about women and women having sex were really different. So what is the obstacle in a romantic comedy that you write in 1989 or 1993? Because she's no longer, you know, uh, she's not lost her honor by having sex with somebody. How do you create obstacles? And she once said something that I thought was kind of interesting. You, both of you probably already know this because you sound like you've researched the heck out of her. And I feel at a disadvantage. But she talked about how the difference for her between having um, a romantic comedy about Jews and a romantic comedy about Christians was for the Christians the obstacles were external, like, say, sleepless in Seattle. They live on different coasts and stuff. Or you've got male. He's threatening her livelihood. 
Whereas with Jews, she felt it was just their own neuroses that got in the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny because she did do the uber Jewish, um, even though it's more interfaith. But When Harry Met Sally is like the uber Jewish romantic comedy. Did you know that they were going to reverse the, that originally it was supposed to be the other way around, that Harry was supposed to be Christian and Sally was supposed to be Jewish? Well, and it, and it kind of makes sense when you think about how that story was developed. I mean, for those who do not know, she wrote the script for it, but the script was a very collaborative process, as most scripts are between the screenwriter and the director, Rob Reiner. And Harry is Rob and she's Sally. So, you know, it kind of makes sense. But it also, when you look back now, it's hard to envision that film any other way than what it was. I was actually very pleased that Sally isn't Jewish because she carries all of the stereotypical Jewish neuroses. But she, by, by, by not making her a Jewish character, it allows her to feel a little bit fresher and a little bit more vibrant to me as a character than if she was just a sort of stereotypical Jewish, hard-nosed kind of crush your balls, which is, which is such a damaging stereotype. It's such a terrible stereotype to, to lob at Jewish women. So, I mean, look, I will say this. One of the things that impresses me the most about Nora Ephron's work in the genre in particular is that there are two types of romantic comedies, in my opinion. One is a romantic comedy that is very much reliant on very kind of flimsy, stereotypical characters, particularly stereotypical women. Um, I think of the Matthew McConaughey romantic comedies, um, and they're just they're what they're they're fine they're lovely they're completely fluffy. She never Nora Ephron never made that. Not one of her films, certainly the three you know films the romantic comedies for which she is most well known. Not they're not stereotypical. I mean there are stereotypes in them, but the characters come alive in a way that is so much more intelligent so much more organic and real. And ultimately the tension that exists is not stereotypical it's it's real it's human that, that's where i think her ability to sort of observe people and interpret people really did her and those films such a service because she was able to elevate them beyond the sort of um, stereotypical romantic comedies and that's why i think there's so many men frankly because it's not a genre that men usually are, get into very much uh, but men love these. There are so many male admirers, not of her, just of her. Certainly there were a lot of that, but male admirers of those films. And that's why, in my opinion. I completely agree, Brad. Something that I was thinking about when you were sort of musing on what her legacy might be and all of that. I and mean, for me, it's the characters. Like, I, again, I don't like rom-coms traditionally, but that's because the ones that I've seen in the age that, you know, coming of age at a time where the ones that were available to me were not Nora Ephron's and then going and watching her work, the characters just felt so three-dimensional. Um, and the even the stories kind of went in a way that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Like when I was watching You've Got Mail recently, I, I, and listeners of this podcast know I love David Wayne. Um, and he did this spoof movie I've mentioned before called They Came Together. And it is literally that type of plot where Paul Rudd's character is opening this huge corporate candy shop across the street from Amy Poehler's. <laughs> yeah. It, it, Eleanor, if you haven't seen this movie, it is wild. It is weird. But um, it, it's this parody movie that's very reverent to the genre. But yeah, Amy Poehler's character has this tiny independently owned um candy shop and anyway I, I i had seen that movie first obviously then went back to see you've got mail and i was like this is so interesting because now i think of that as a trope but in that movie it never felt like a trope and so when i think of her legacy i think of other female filmmakers like nicole haloff center and and others who no matter what genre they're operating in it's about fleshing out these characters who are more than just some archetype. And I think um, Meg Ryan, as much as she's known for a lot of rom-coms, both Efron's and others, I just keep going back to You've Got Mail because I went in with different expectations than what I got. And what I got was so much more nuanced. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking her legacy is honestly going to be, is like female screenwriters and directors taking the time to 
subvert expectations by simply being observational and being cognizant of, you know, human qualities, flaws, everything like that. So, you know, I, I do think that she was sort of the trailblazer in that, at least in this genre. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's really well put. Um, I, I often wondered how come um, in more classic, you know, screwball comedies, let's say, or whatever, they were able to come up with males and females that were of interest. Um, the women had, you know, insecurities or dreams or whatever, just like the guys did. And then it sort of seemed like it drifted away and like there was nobody really imagining two fully fleshed characters going at each other or in ending up with each other. Um, something that Tom Hanks said about how, why he liked working on these movies was that they were about adults. They were about people who had been through pain and compromise and making difficult choices. And, and they, well, just like what you were saying, they weren't just fluff. They weren't just, gosh, I hope they get together. It was more than that. I'm invested in these characters and these people. So I think absolutely. And I think, um, Brad, we sort of touched already on whether her films mean something different to men and women. And obviously, I think, again, her the fact that she is so prolific and and particularly, a, I would say, a role model for up and coming female filmmakers Um I, Brad, I would love to hear if you think that as a man, if you do approach her films differently than a woman might. I, I, what I'm hearing is that because these characters are so full um, and so kind of outside of stereotypes in a way, um, you know, that that's why men love these movies, too. And then I also think we should go back to this question of her Jewish identity and how that does or does not manifest in her films, because I think that's um, something else that's very interesting to think about. I think I must approach them differently. I, I couldn't tell you how I approach them differently, but I, I do think that there is, even if I'm, you know, it doesn't matter who you are as a guy, I think the reality is the experiences of women and the experiences of men are are just so different in our society that to that everything that we approach on some level we approach differently and in her case partly because she was working in romantic comedies a lot that was not all the, i i want to take a moment just to say that was not the only thing she did in, in the films um and certainly Julia and Julia which was her last film would not fall necessarily into that category i just think that um regardless of what she was working on, um, but especially because of some of those films and the, and, the, and the structure of those genres, so much of what she was doing was talking about the collisions of men and women and the ways in which men and women don't quite respond to each other the same way or to even to sort of normal circumstances the same way. So I, I'm sure I must, but I, I try very hard to watch the films, to read her writing, and appreciate all of the characters equally, um, which is very easy to do. I mean, I think that's one of the things that she was able to sit down with when when Harry met Sally and peer into Rob Reiner's soul, frankly, and just see his depress depressive personality and, and turn that into a character that's fascinating and interesting and empathetic, um, or at least that you can empathize with, and, and understand him. It wasn't just that she was paying attention. She actively understood something about Rob Reiner and she turned that into an active understanding of what the character of Harry was doing and how Harry felt. And she was that thoughtful about all of her characters. And then she did the same thing with Sally. Um, and so it was very easy to watch her films and kind of appreciate all of the characters differently. But at the same time, I'm very much reminded of the fact that one of the things that she said about that movie was that it was fundamentally not about whether women and men could be friends. It was about the fact that men and women don't understand each other, mainly because men don't want to, to try to understand women, um, which is a very true thing to say, I think, but also a very cutting criticism of men. And so... I remember reading uh, about that film and just sort of looking at all of her work and realizing how much of her work um, is about sexism and misogyny and the ways in which men approach things and women approach things differently. And I just am conscious of it all the time. 
and I and I and like I said, I don't know what to take from that. I don't know how to describe how it, but I I can't imagine that I approach these films and get the same thing from them as women do. For me, I always wondered how much catharsis was in these stories for women, because as a guy who is white and privileged and all of those things. Oh, don't um, beat yourself up. Don't beat no, yourself. No, no, no. And I'm not beating myself up, but I recognize that I'm walk I'm kind of I've got a lot of privilege going on. So I, for me it was like, eh. But I'm always reminded of the fact that this is a woman who she was married once to a writer. She was divorced. Um she was married again to another writer who she found this is Carl Bernstein, who she found out was having an affair with a mutual friend while she was pregnant with their second son. She turned that story into a novel, which was later with Heartburn, which was later adapted into the Mike Nichols film with Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep. She was she was faced with professional sexism literally at Newsweek. She was she she was the things that have happened, she was incredibly at peace with herself and with the world around her. I'm reminded of that fact that I, I don't have anything close to that in experience in my lifetime. I mean, this is a woman who knew who Deep Throat was. She was married to Carl Bernstein. She guessed correctly that Deep Throat was Mark Felt. And nobody, and she was very open about this for years, and nobody would believe her. Like, the media didn't pick up on it. Nobody but her sons believed. I mean, this is a woman who was who had plenty of reason to be annoyed and bitter at the world, especially men. And rather than be that, she was incredibly warm and empathetic and listening and, and understanding of men. Like, I just don't, I don't think as a guy watching the films that she's made and in reading the writing that she's written about and knowing how much of it is about sexism is about how I can not sit here and go, Oh, I should sit here and just sort of listen. No, seriously. No, you're, 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 you are being too hard on yourself. You know, the, the, the culture is very important. She's like, she graduated from Wellesley in 1962, and she was asked to come back in 1996 and give the commencement speech there. And one of the things that she said that I, I thought was pretty amazing, and that, of course, now, I mean, to you, Sarah, this must be like, you know, uh, like a duh. But she said, back then, we were supposed to, we weren't supposed to have a destiny. We were supposed to marry our destiny. And, you know, y'all, I again, being older than you, not that old, but still, I mean, I'm part of a cusp generation that saw that that sort of change. And one of the things that you just made me realize while y'all were talking is how much, it, especially saying when Harry met Sally, I can identify with things that Billy Crystal says and goes through as much as I can identify with things that um, Meg Ryan says and goes through. I think that's pretty brilliant. I completely agree. I think that I, I just keep going back to this idea that these characters are so fully fleshed out. And and Brad, I love the way you articulated it too, that, that she just has this understanding of humans um, and these little nuances of, of gender, but, but doesn't, sort of villainize any of them or or play them too over the top. Um, I think that's something I mentioned earlier that like her films just feel so grounded um, in reality and in experience. And I too am impressed that how much warmth, um, you know, she exhibited in her work and in her life after everything she'd been through. Um, I, yeah, she's incredible. I I know that I sort of skipped ahead for a second wanting to I just really, the, the Jewish question, I think, is something that we haven't really dug into yet. And and I want to kind of reframe it because we're talking about the different lived experiences that each of us might be bringing to these films based on who we are, when we are watching them, gender, all of these things. When Harry Met Sally is this quintessential, one of those quintessential Jewish films as we've been talking about. I know that she wasn't um, like religiously Jewish, but culturally so. And I'm just curious what both your, th I'm very much the student on this episode, if anyone couldn't tell. Like I am learning so much from both of you. I'm learning from you, Sarah. So, Oh, <laughs> I am. I'm learning from both of you guys. So just stop that part too. <laughs> <laughs> we all learn from each other. That's why, you there know, you that's why these conversations are so great. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know that we're the Jewish film podcast and Nora Ephron was, you know, Jewish, but 
does that come up in her work? And do you think that viewers who have that particular identity or lived experience might be bringing something else altogether that we haven't touched on, um, you know, to these films? I don't, what are what are your thoughts, <laughs> Brad? <laughs> oh, I go first here. Um... <laughs> Well, you are the guy, so you should. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, very funny. Um, I think. I mean, look, she was she was extremely self-identified. I mean, she was very proudly Jewish, but she was also very clearly not religiously Jewish. Um, and I think that's both fine and also probably the more common version of, of Jewish uh, in this country anyways. So I don't think you can, I don't think you can look at her work and escape the Jewishness of it, but the Jewishness is not slap you upside the head Jewishness. Um, it's not going out of its way to be seen as Jewish. And I don't think that's a conscious choice on her part. I think that's just a, a, a genuine organic reflection of who she is and who she was. I do think the humor, I do think the sensibility, I do think the intellectualism that she brought to her work, I think that's, I think there's something about that is just deeply Jewish. Um, if you're not Jewish, you might not notice it as Jewish. Like when she was throwing an insult, it wasn't an insult. It was a perfectly crafted, cleverly, you know, composed, extremely intellectual insult. Um, after, uh, her after her marriage to Carl Bernstein when she was writing Heartburn, the husband in that novel is described as quote capable of having sex with a Venetian blind unquote, which is one of the best insults I've ever. I think that's Jewish. I think that's for me when I look back and uh, whether it's her films or her essays, the Jewishness is that tone. It's that sensibility. It's sort of layered there, and I think that is um, a big part of what the Jewish cultural output in America is: is that tone, that sort of intellectualized, clever w approach. And sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's cutting, and sometimes it's smart. And usually, it's all three. And when it's all three, it's really the best of it. And she was so good at being all three at the same time. Well, I have to say that I, I do know some very clever Christian people, very intellectual Christian people. I have to stand up for the Christians that are just as smart as Jews. But I do also want to point out she hated being identified as a woman director. She hated being identified as a Jewish director. Um, she just wanted to be she didn't mind being identified as a New York director which I think is interesting because for many people, New York is simply synonymous with saying, oh, you mean somebody Jewish. And she was, I know you guys already know this, but I'll just say it out loud for the other folks. When she was, when she was accepted at Wellesley, um, they had a thing on the application, you know, what is your religion? And she thought that was an inappropriate question. So she didn't fill it in. And they just kept after her until they, until she finally did fill it in. And she said she was Jewish. And sure enough, there was, not only a Jewish quota for Wellesley at that time, but she was assigned a Jewish roommate. In other words, if she said she was Catholic, she would have gotten a Catholic roommate, Protestant, whatever. And in one of her, actually, I think it's one of the articles that y'all suggested to me that I read. Um, she sort of says, well, you know, she knew that she was a Jew. She didn't necessarily identify with being Jewish but she realized it didn't matter because other people saw her as a Jew or Jewish and that she herself would have to come to terms with that and whatever that meant to her in her personal life or professional life, whatever. Yeah, she grew up in a time. I mean, that's the thing that we forget. We live in an era where there's, again, there's still anti-Semitism. There's lots of things. But to be Jewish today is not what it was to be Jewish in the 50s and 60s. To be Jewish then was to be limited Yes, of course, we're heading backwards, you know, as quickly as we can. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, that I think for her to be, it wasn't like she was actively running away from Judaism. It was just her Judaism was more cultural. She was not religiously Jewish in the way that people, that, you know, to be Christian is to be religiously Christian. To be Jewish, you can be culture, you can be lots of different things. So for her, but the outside world, as you say, in that era, to be Jewish was to be restricted. Yeah. And for someone who grew up in that climate to then be turned around, even in success, uh, to be labeled as Jewish blank, Jewish writer, Jewish director, whatever, there's that itch of, you, don't, don't pigeonhole me, don't limit me. 
And also, I mean, Brid and Sarah, I mean, does somebody say, you know, William Wyler, that Jewish director, Billy Wilder, William Wyler, Billy Wilder, you know, that Jewish director, Fred Zinnemann, you know, that Jewish director. I mean, Woody Allen, we, Mel Brooks, we go, yeah, that Jewish director. Nora Ephron, we go, yeah, that Jewish, although we do woman first. When she was talking about, she was asked what things she would miss once she was, you know, passed away and what she wouldn't. And two of the things that she wouldn't miss, she said quite strongly, were bar mitzvahs and panels about women on film. <laughs> so I think she's trying to tell us something. She is. I mean, that's the thing that I always remind myself of working at a Jewish film festival doing this podcast is that we go to people like her and say this Jewish filmmaker, and we're saying it very pridefully. We're saying it very, we're, we're, we, are, we look at their work and we are so amazed by it that we want to claim them as ours. But that's not always their experience um, on, on, the, on the other end of it. I do want to, before we close out um, this conversation, I do want to go back to that Wellesley commencement address, and I want to quote the end of it, because I do think more than anything that it speaks to her ability to go beyond her own experience and really embrace the people, the world, the culture around her, which again, I do think is the sort of quintessential aspect of her creativity. But I'm just going to read a little bit of this. She said at the end... Um, as someone said in a movie I made, don't laugh. This is my life. This is the life many women lead. Two paths diverge in a wood, and we get to take them both. It's another of the nicest things about being women. We can do that. Did I say it was hard? Yes. But let me say it again so that none of you can ever say the words, nobody said it was hard. But it's also incredibly interesting. You are so lucky to have that life as an option. Whatever you choose, however many roads you travel, I hope that you choose not to be a lady. I hope you will find some way to break the rules and make a little trouble over there. And I also hope that you will choose to make some of that trouble on behalf of women. Thank you. Good luck. The first act of your life is over. Welcome to the best years of your lives. Oh, that's wonderful. That's so pretty. And, and, and in the same speech, she says, be the heroine of your life, not the victim. That was her philosophy. I think that was why she could go through all the things that she went through in her personal life. Um, and people, she didn't talk about her 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 cancer that killed her. Um, she didn't tell anybody. She got the diagnosis and she kept it to herself. She was someone who just fundamentally understood that whatever happens to you in life, how you choose to approach life is your choice. And I think she embraced the choice of being interested, of being curious, of wanting to not write off people. I, and I admire that so much in her work and in her writing. And I think it's a wonderful place to leave the conversation on. Well, if I have to leave, I guess I will. But I will say also, it is so cool to have people like you and Sarah, totally different people from me, who I'm expected to identify and, quote, worship her. And there's the two of y'all. You couldn't be more different from me. And um, you're just saying wonderful. You're just a wonderful audience for her. And I think, wow, that would just make her so happy that that would be part of her legacy, that such different people would really embrace her. Yeah, I think that's an equally incredible place to end things. We've talked so much about the universality and the relatability of her work. I think all of these last things from that speech, especially about like identity and, and Eleanor, I actually had no idea that, um, you know, she kind of rejected these labels um, that maybe some some of us want to project onto her. But all in all, I, I do think that this very much encapsulates her legacy. So um, this was a great conversation. And until next time, we are your hosts, Sarah Glassberg. And Brad Pilcher. And I guess I'm the guest. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it, guys. Thanks so much for including me. Thank you again. Yes, we had such a great time. Thank you so much for being our special guest, Eleanor. Um, and just to close us out, of course, producing is Chris Holland, our technical director and editor extraordinaire. <laughs> the music, the music you're tapping your toes to as we're speaking is by the incomparable Joe Alterman. Please look him up wherever you get your music. 
Um, you can always find more from us as well as show notes. And I think there will be probably plenty um, from this conversation uh, at ajff.org slash in conversation. Our email address is in conversation at ajff.org. Drop us your questions and comments. Maybe let us know your favorite Nora Ephron film or what you love about her as a filmmaker. And we just might bring that back up in a future episode. Don't forget to subscribe in your podcast app of choice or check out our YouTube channel for new episodes. Give us a rating, a review. Every little bit helps. And of course, please tell your friends about the show. Until next time, goodbye. I'll have what she's having. <laughs>